We're going to be in 1 Corinthians today, so if you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just to get a head start. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to share a message I entitled, All Eyes on Jesus. And uh, my intention with this message is that we counter the division that's going on in our world by us as the church being united as much as possible as the church because of what's going on. Division in our world is, is not new. Uh, it's just that the past few months has definitely uh, felt like an increase in that division, hasn't it? And uh, it feels like we've been in constant conflict these days. And that can take a toll on you emotionally, you know, even physically, spiritually. And the reasons for this increase of conflict are, are obvious. We all know what those reasons are, right? It is an election year. There is the COVID-19 pandemic, and then there's just pure evil in our world. So conflict tends to rise around these times. Let's just be honest. And how the church handles the division in this world is crucial. If we're not careful, we can get pulled into it, making matters worse. And we can let the issues of our world actually cause division in the church or even add division to it. The Bible communicates that unity in the church is essential. It is key. It is paramount. We need to be careful then that we are not letting outside circumstances that the world wrestles with affect the church from within. And even down to the point of this, if we let our differences about COVID-19 and let our differences about things going on in our world um, divide us as a church. A question that I've been kind of concerned about is, is if we let those things divide us, what are we going to do when persecution comes against the church even more? In other words, if we can't get along about some small petty things, how are we going to handle the real heavy things? You follow me on that? And so we as a church, it is, it is key. And I'm starting with Calvary and I'm thinking about the church in America. I'm thinking about the church around the world. Uh, it is key that we have some focus that unites us all. And so again, that's why I titled my message, All Eyes on Jesus. And the question I'm, I'm trying to answer today is how does the church live united in a divided world? How do we do that? So the first thing is, obvious, the obvious answer is, the church needs to keep our eyes on Jesus. And I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because Paul actually addresses a lot of divisions in the church through this entire letter. And he starts in the beginning with uh, something that's a concern I think we can learn from. So I'm going to read right from verse 1. It says this, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Sosthenes. And I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere. Notice he says there, for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. In other words, what unites us right there is Jesus. You see that? No matter where you are. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And then he goes on to give thanks to God. He says, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems like the, the writers, the apostles, and the followers of Christ, they really write about the return of Jesus a lot, don't they? We've been having many different scriptures recently. He will keep you strong to the end 
so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. <clears throat> wow, what do we see here? What we see here is, is that the Corinthian church was actually beginning to be divided over their allegiance to man. As they took their eyes off of the gospel and off of God and off of Jesus, they began to have factions within the church where they followed different Peter. I follow Paul. Well, I follow Apollos. Apollos, by the way, was a very talented um, speaker and teacher in the church. You can read about him in the book of Acts. He was very influential. Um, so he was probably very charismatic and very, you know, people were probably attracted to his leadership. And then you have Peter, the one who really kind of started the church when Jesus left. And, and so Peter's highly admired. And, and, uh, and then, you, of course, you have Paul. But then, the, and then there's some who say, I only follow Jesus. And the issue here is actually that there was this contentious spirit against each other. Well, I follow this guy, and I, and I follow this one. And that's actually a cultural thing, because basically the Pharisees did the practicing of the Jewish practice of bringing people together, and you would have your rabbi. And your rabbi would have their followers, which were called disciples. So when Jesus made his own disciples, Jesus was actually using the culture of his day and of his people to create his own following called disciples. Well, this would be something that they were used to is kind of lining up behind someone and saying, I follow that person. The thing is, is that now it's, because, it's become a division in the church. It's causing this division in the church. And so Paul's confronting it. And even to the point, you know, where he brings up baptism, you know, it's you're all baptized into God, into Christ, not into people. The, the reason why this was an issue is because they began to view their faith through human wisdom and not through the spirit of God. And you can read that in the rest of this chapter where Paul goes on to talk about the wisdom of God versus the wisdom of this world. And their allegiance to these people were an issue because there was this prideful attitude and again, this contentious spirit. And even the people who said, well, I only follow Jesus. I only follow Jesus. Even they were being corrected by Paul for having this haughty spirit, this prideful spirit of, oh yeah, well, I follow, I follow Jesus. So there was this temptation to raise people up higher than Jesus or higher than God. And here's the thing, their conflict was now becoming an issue. Their desire to line themselves up with allegiance with some person was actually causing some serious division and arguments in the church. We don't get to hear about all of them. All we know is, is Paul was warned by Chloe's household that there's some serious division going on because people are trying to follow a certain person. Paul finishes this chapter with this verse, with these lines. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. 
He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. So Paul corrects them and says, hey, if you're going to make it about anyone, make it about the Lord. It's the Lord. Peter didn't do it. Apollos didn't do it. I didn't do it. Jesus did it. All our eyes need to be on Jesus. Because if Jesus isn't the united focus, division is inevitable, church. As soon as they took their eyes off of Jesus and did it with the right attitude, they had the wrong attitude. As soon as that happened, things got bad in the church. Philippians 2, 1 through 10, Paul says this to the Philippian church. Therefore, if any of you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be united in our identity, our thinking, and our purpose on earth. We know how to think. We know how to love. We know how to live as the body of Christ because of Jesus. Because of the word of God, they are both our guide on how we should live on this earth and how we should be in unity in the church. And for all the reasons and there are many reasons a church could be divided. Jesus is what keeps a church united. Because there's a lot of things that could divide a church. There is. Why do we have so many denominations? There's a lot of reasons, but one thing unites us all, and that is the church of Jesus Christ that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ that keeps their eyes on Jesus Christ. I love, I love, here's the thing about Calvary you have to understand about our DNA. Okay, if you're new to Calvary, if you're watching online today, I want you to know something. Our first focus is on Jesus. We look at the word of God and we look at Jesus in the word of God. And we go, that's our foundation. Because he says in Matthew 7, if you do not listen to my teaching and obey them, when the storms come, it's going to fall apart. Your house will fall apart. And I don't want Calvary to fall apart because of division in our world or division in our church. So we keep our eyes on Jesus, but not just that. We don't just listen. Matthew 7 says, when he taught that parable of the sand and the water, he said, don't just listen, but obey my teaching. It's those who obey my teaching, they will be able to withstand whatever may come. So important for us as a church. If this world is dividing the church, I'm going to say something a little honest. Now, you're getting used to that, right? The past few weeks, God has just been, he's been hitting me with some hard stuff, and I'm just, I'm just transferring to you. If this world is dividing the church, then the world has become greater than Christ in us. Because here's the thing, we say greater is he that is in us, right? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Unless we have made the world greater in us than Jesus. If the world has become greater in us, there will be division in the church. Because we will cater to the world first before we cater to Christ. Jesus must be greater in us than anything else in this world. And so the question I have for myself and for us is, is Jesus the king of our hearts? Does Jesus rule our hearts? If there are points of conflict and contention because of false teaching in the church, then yes, that is a reason for there to be some division. There's a reason. Like there's some natural conflict that's going to happen when there's some false teaching in churches. Let me give you a couple examples. One is some churches may teach faith versus work. So they'll teach that if you, if you do a bunch of things, you're saved, 
But the, the gospel is that when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved, and that's why you do things for God. That's the truth of the gospel. So when, when you go to a church and they teach you that you are only saved by con, conditioned on whether you do this, this, or this, that is a false teaching. That is something that churches need to have a discussion about. Okay, that is not following Jesus. Another one is, Paul dealt with this in 1 Corinthians. There were some people weaseling their way into the church saying Jesus didn't have a bodily resurrection. In other words, his, re- his body was stolen somehow, some way, but his spirit rose. No, his entire body rose from the grave. That's important because we're supposed to also have a new body when we are resurrected. And Jesus has the power not to just rise from the dead spiritually, but to rise from the dead physically. That way there could be no argument that it actually happened. There was false teaching slipping in the church, trying to tell the Corinthian church that Jesus did not rise entirely, with, even with his body. He only rose spiritually. Paul had to confront that false teaching. And here's the thing. You can't be united if there's not Jesus in it. Like, if, if the truth of Jesus isn't in it, there's going to be division in the church. But at least it's over doctrine, right? It's over doctrine, not what our world is wrestling with. Now, here's the thing. We have to be able to deal with worldly issues. When the worldly issues begin to affect the family of God, which is unavoidable, we have to stick together, church. We have to stick together. But here's the thing. Well, how do we stick together, Ryan? Like, how do we know what's together? Good question, right? This. Jesus. There's going to be some hard truth that hits you in the face. And I'm talking to those who may have just given your life to Jesus recently. Those of you who are still learning the faith, you may have been raised to believe something is true only to find out when you get in the word of God, it is not. And we that have been raised in church all of our lives, we may find as we study the word of God and we mature, there's some things we believed that was true that was not. And the Bible corrects it. And we have to be humble enough to receive that correction and to realize that that point of contention, I should not let it divide me with my brother or sister in Christ. But it's going to be a weird journey together, isn't it? To go through the next few months here, all the way into November, because we're a very diverse church, aren't we? And so we have to be careful to stick together and keep our eyes on Jesus and keep our eyes in the word and know that God should lead us in everything we say and do. And I mean everything. We must be familiar with biblical truth. So when the lies of this world come to our doorstep, which they already have, we are not deceived. And we don't want to be those who are guilty of influencing our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to fall for some deception. Amen? I don't have time to go into the variety of examples. I'm, I'm praying you fill in the gaps. If there is even a bandwagon in our society that is not proclaiming the name and truth of Jesus, we better think twice before we hop on. We really need to be careful. That's why last week's message was so key. And that's really why I feel like God is really trying to get us as a church to look at everything going on right now through a kingdom perspective. Because while it looks like there's only a couple ways, and although with COVID there seems to be 30 different views, it's insane, isn't it? There is still the way of God. There really is. There still is the way of Jesus in this entire situation. Because he reigns supreme over all circumstances. We just have to be willing to slow down and let him lead us and teach us and show us the way. The devil knows how to divide us, church. If he can get our eyes off of Jesus and onto this world or one another or even ourselves, one of those three will replace the throne that belongs to the king of kings. 
The devil wants you to be like this church in Corinthians where, well, I follow, I follow, I follow, and your eyes are off of Jesus. He wants you to do that. He wants to use this world to divide us, church. He really does. Because if he can hurt the church, then it will slow the progress of the kingdom expanding here in America and around the world. If he can get us fighting with each other, then we're not busy fighting for souls. Understood? So, what's the second way we stay united in a divided world? We need to learn to love one another like Jesus. It's interesting, those who claim to follow Jesus, they actually didn't follow with love in 1 Corinthians. Paul corrected those who said, well, I follow Jesus only. Why did he correct them? Because again, they had a haughty, contentious, prideful attitude. What would have been the better way of doing it? Well, those who follow Jesus, us who follow Jesus, <clears throat> when we see people off keeping their eyes on something else, we don't jump into the comparison trap. Well, I, I, well I'm, I'm following Christ and Christ alone. No, 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 no. We should have compassion for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are off. And we should say something and we should warn them and encourage them to come back to keeping their eyes on Jesus. Instead of them compassionately correcting their fellow brothers and sisters, they actually jumped in the comparison. And I guess I better say this then, that we better be ready to be warned and corrected by our fellow brothers and sisters if we are off. And by the way, I mean, I've said some pretty heavy stuff in the past few weeks, and you have been taking it with grace. And I just thank God for that. And I thank you for being such a teachable church, such a, such a humble church. We don't pretend like we have it all together. We are willing to keep learning from God. Isn't that awesome? I'm not saying let's get boastful about that or prideful about that, but I thank God for the humility in this church that we're willing to be corrected by the word of God. Because isn't that one of the uses of the word of God according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? It is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. The word of God is. So we may need to warn one another, hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. And I think that's what God's been doing in the past few weeks. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It doesn't mean that we ignore what's going on in our world. It just means we look for the way that Jesus wants us to respond. We can't avoid this world. We live in it. Jesus has left us in this world to deal with it, but he asked us to deal with it the way he would deal with it. And this is what it says in Colossians 3, 12 through 15. This is the love of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Did you know that you are holy in God's eyes and that you are loved? And because you are loved, you are able to love others. Clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothing is one of the first things you see people wear. It's the first thing you see on people. Eyes, smile, clothing, right? And clothing should be seen, right? Hopefully, <laughs> you should see clothes on people. Praise God for that. And you can even feel it sometimes, you know? If you give a hug or the Christian side hug. You should be able to experience, in other words, the love of Jesus Christ. When you get around someone, you see the clothing. If you give them a hug or maybe you wear your own, you can feel. In other words, the love of Jesus should be obvious, is what Paul is trying to say. Put it on and let others see and experience the love of who? The love of Ryan? <clears throat> no. The love of Jesus which is an entire lifelong journey of learning how to do. Did you know that? It's not easy. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, 
And this one, love is patient, right? 1 Corinthians 13, the first word that Jesus, or that Paul gives us about love is, love is what? Love is patient. <clears throat> I don't like that. I don't want to be patient. I don't want to be, that word patience there means to be gracious with each other. Bear with each other and forgive one another. Bearing, have you ever put up with someone? <laughs> For a long time? Some of you are hitting your spouse right now. <clears throat> I remember going on car rides with my sister, going to Ohio to see my brother or things like that. And let me tell you, I had to learn this verse fast in the back seat. We're both tall. We're in the back of a Chevy Lumina with no leg room. And she's got three pillows for some reason on this road trip. And I'm sitting there with my little tiny real estate on this chair, you know, and I'm sweating because my mom's cold and it's, you know what I mean? Like you just got to bear with that situation. That's nothing compared to what we're dealing with right now, isn't it? In other words, there's, there's going to be some things that you see your friends post. You got to go ahead and just bite your teeth, bite your tongue. Grit your teeth, sorry. Grit your teeth, bite your tongue. You know what I mean? You just have to learn to bear with one another. There may be something that someone says in the church. There may be things that Ryan says that I am not perfect at. Sometimes you just got to bear with me because I'm still learning. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of patience and grace that, G that Paul is talking about here that we have with one another. Forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. I pray that this church forgives and apologize. The first thing is, if you need to apologize, seek that person out and apologize. I think it's always kind of funny when you read this scripture because it's like, forgive one another. Isn't that kind of assuming that that person did something wrong against you? I'm going to go forgive you. I, hey, I forgive you for hurting me. I didn't even know I hurt you. Well, I'm forgiving you anyway. That's just kind of weird, right? We, that's why humility is in this paragraph. To humble yourselves and apologize. I pray that we could humble ourselves, apologize, and forgive each other before any issues become a giant mountain to deal with. Amen? Amen. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's why you should forgive. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. This kind of love that you're reading here is not love that you will find in this world, is it? You will not find this kind of love in this world because it only comes from above and it's through Jesus Christ. But the thing is, is this kind of love is the love of the Holy Spirit living in you, the love of the presence of God living in you. And we are channels of this love in our world. We are. And we're supposed to be that kind of love in this church first, in our body first. The love of Jesus, this is the takeaway for you. This kind of love is unbreakable and durable through any circumstance or conflict. I mean, if you think about it, when you have a conflict with a brother or sister in Christ, this teaches you to fix it and solve it before it gets worse. Our world teaches you to just put up walls and grudges and walk away. It's unbreakable and durable through any circumstance. We really do need to be compassionate towards one another right now. We need to pick and choose our battles. This has been a rough four to five months for all of us, hasn't it? I've never seen more unpredictable circumstances in all the years I have lived. And then to now lead a church and not know what's coming up next month. I have literally been barely careful about even trying to do certain things or plan certain things because everything is so unpredictable. I was saying this on a live video that we posted on our private page that we did a live video from uh, Instagram that it's, you know, what we're doing right now is we're just grabbing our surfboards and we're going for a ride. And I can't even surf. I can bodyboard like boogie boards, but I can't surf. 
I mean, that's what Christianity is right now. That's, that's, that's what it's like leading in this crisis right now. That's what it's like having a business. That's what it's like being at home. That's what it's like looking at your 401k. That's what it's like, right? It's like you're riding some crazy waves, huge waves. But here's the thing. If we can look at it more of the church, we're all in this raft together. How about a raft? And everyone's got to grab their paddles, and they just got to get along no matter what opinions and stances we have. You just got to survive. I was in a whitewater rafting accident. I did not know everyone on that raft very well. There were some people that kind of annoyed me, and just be honest, when I was a teenager, you know, there's certain people that annoy you, right? I'm on that raft. I didn't care what kind of issues I had with them. I just wanted them to come rescue me as I went down the river in 10 degree water. Like no joke, I was freezing. I didn't care, I wanted them to, to bail out the water and get down the river. Thankfully, a kayaker instructor was there to catch me. I didn't care what issues we had because we are one, because we're all in the same raft with Jesus Christ. Amen? Again, when the wave of persecution, when the wave of persecution hits the church, a lot of the stuff that we fight over needs to just go out the window. Bail that water out and let's go down the river. Understood? So let's be patient, gracious towards one another, towards this church, towards our neighbors and community, because everyone is just trying to get through this craziness in our world. Humility is so key here. Unity keeps the needs of the whole over our own. Okay, he says, have humility. Philippians 2, he goes in and says this in Philippians chapter 2 as well. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. When I read this, you know what I thought about? I thought that the cost of unity is our selfish ambitions. There's a cost to unity, isn't there? There's a price to keep unity and it's to really abandon our selfish ambitions for the whole. Selfishness and unity do not dwell together. The old adage, there's no I in team, right? A community that is united in Jesus serves before it takes. I think of Achan and the book of Joshua. He gave in to his desires to keep the treasures that he found, even, even though they were commanded not to take any of the treasures after battle. He dug a hole under his tent and hid them. People died because of that selfish act of sin. Because our selfishness hurts, but our sacrifice and obedience to God for the whole helps. When we do our part in the body of Christ, everyone else is blessed. By the way, when someone in the body of Christ is hurting, we should hurt with them and mourn with them. That's what scripture says. When someone is winning, we should celebrate with them. Amen? That is what scripture says. And so when we do our part, when we're faithful to, be, to live in such a way that we think of the whole, we help each other. We help each other. And I want to focus, I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. I, I want to focus on Colossians 3.15, where it says this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. As I was preparing for this message, I just felt like God wanted me to hone in on something for this verse, even though it may not seem directly um, relatable. Conflict... This is more personal, and that's what it is. It's more personal. Conflict in, in your heart actually breeds conflict in relationships. If we have conflict going on in here about ourselves or about whatever in life, you know what happens is we have this disposition to have conflict with everyone else. In other words, when conflict rules our hearts, we take conflict to every area of our lives. 
Conflict becomes this filter or lens of how we view people. Another, here's another example. We may go into conversations thinking there's conflict when there isn't. We may assume that we are arguing with someone online because we, well, first of all, we don't see their mannerisms. But reality is you actually have more in, in unity than you have in division with that person, more in common. We can have so much conflict in our lives because we haven't gotten right with God about certain things. We've had bad experiences in the past that we've never dealt with or confronted that we bring this conflict into situations that are now bleeding into our society. Because we haven't dealt with conflict in our nation that needs to be dealt with, we are dealing with it today, aren't we? And what's happening is we need to lovingly deal with that personally with God because here's what we see here is He says that Christ should rule in your heart because Christ is the source of peace for you. The peace of Christ can actually cause treaties and ceasefires towards one another. Because when you're at peace about something that has taken place in your life, you won't go into those relationships or into the church with the same assumption. I, we deal with this all the time with church hurt. People have been legitimately hurt by church. And until we deal with whatever happened in their previous church, they will most likely not trust us here at Calvary. And so many conversations I have with people is helping them wrestle with that hurt that they've experienced. And many times it may be legitimate. It may not be from leadership. It may just be from people in the church or it might be through leadership. So once we deal with that conflict, they're able to sit here or be a part of this body in peace. That's an example of what I'm trying to say. The peace of Christ can help. When Jesus, and here's what I see going on here. When Jesus rules your heart, peace rules. If Jesus is peace, the Prince of Peace, and he's in your heart, Guess what's going to rule your heart? Peace. You'll see less conflict in the body of Christ. And so again, the question is, is Jesus the king of your heart? So I'll wrap it up with this statement and these scriptures. I think this is so important. The victory of our unity is worth the cost of our surrender. The victory of our unity is worth the cost of our surrender. What do I mean? When our focus is on Jesus instead of ourself, it will help our world see Jesus. Well, let me give you some scripture to back that up. John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 17, 22 through 23, I have given them the glory you gave me. This is Jesus praying to his father. He's talking about his disciples. So they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Wow. And then one of my favorites, 1 John 4, 11 to 12. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. And his love is brought to full expression in us. So our love and our unity actually helps people see Jesus. And that's ultimately a great reason to live in unity and surrender our own ambitions to keep unity. And there could be many things that we need to surrender. What do people see in us? Do they see us loving each other online? Do they see us handling conflict and differences with the love of Jesus? Do they see the other way, the way of the kingdom? How much of a relief would it be to see a church stand together for God and for the salvation of our fellow man? The hurting and lost community in our nation I am willing to lay down my personal opinions if it helps someone, first of all, hear the gospel and see the gospel lived out. 
That should be my first focus, is help people know the gospel before they know my personal opinions about everything going on in the world. Because my personal opinions and stances aren't gonna change a thing. Only Jesus will. God has been clear the past few weeks. He's been saying to us here at Calvary to have kingdom vision through this season. So I just wanna encourage us all to keep our eyes on Jesus and let him lead us into the next few months. And let's see what he wants us to see. And let's do what he wants us to do. Amen? I didn't give you many examples of that because again, there's so many in the Bible. I pray that God leads you to do the right thing. Let me stand together to pray. I just want to let you know, church, I love you. I am taking a couple weeks off just to get a break and to rest with my family. And Pastor Jody will be here next week. Pastor Coon will be preaching as well and um, in two weeks. So I am taking a, some time to rest, um, thankfully. Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so if resting um, entails being with your family, then I'll take it, you know. And uh, I'm sure chasing them around is going to be fun. But uh, I just want to say I love you, church. Um, I know that if we all keep our eyes on Jesus, whatever is going to come in the next few months, we can, we can do it. All right? And just, just do me a favor real quick. I know you can't do this online, but in this room, look around real quick. Look at, look at every... I know this is going to be awkward, but just look at each other real quick. <laughs> this, this, these people, they matter more than any conflict that we should, we don't want to let conflict divide us, okay? Like these are souls and there's blood running through our veins. There's eternity in this room. That's what matters most. The eternal perspective versus the temporary conflict we're dealing with in this world, the troubles, the temporary troubles. This is what matters right here. And then what matters is the people outside as well as that need Jesus too, amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word today. And Lord, we don't have it all figured out. And, and I didn't give all the answers today. But we know that if we keep our eyes on your son, Jesus, we will know what to do and what to think, what to say, how to live. So God, we decide today to all put our eyes on Jesus, to seek out what he would want us to do during this season. We thank you that this entire time he's been leading the way as we follow him. Lord, we commit ourselves to do that. And we thank you for the unity we have and we foster it and grow it by loving one another. And God, when things come up, may we deal with it with the way Jesus asked us to deal with it. We love you, God. We thank you and we praise you. While things seem out of control, you are still in charge. And so we rest at peace today knowing that you have a plan and as long as we're sticking close to you and enduring and keeping our faith in you, that we can be at peace, that it's all going to work out. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.